All right, so let's wrap this bad boy up on amino acids and peptides and talk about what amino acids do when we bring them together, how we bring them together, and what they're capable of as part of a larger protein. So we've already talked about the three-dimensional structure of amino acids and what generally they share in common. We, in the last chunk, talked about amino acid side chains and their individual importance and their biochemical properties, different types of amino acids. We'll start this lecture by talking about the peptide bond, how we link amino acids together one by one, and then once we do link them, what they can do as a series or sequence of amino acids. We'll end with a short discussion on small functional polypeptides. These are proteins made up of just a couple dozen amino acids and what those do in the living cell. So the peptide bond, how amino acids are held together in a chain or a string. Congrats for you. Give yourself a pat on the back, high five the computer screen, because you know a lot about amino acids now. We've covered the bare bones of amino acids, but certainly we understand enough to place them into the larger context of proteins. But remember, that's what we cared about. We cared about the proteins. We cared about amino acids because amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. We cared about amino acids because amino acids are what we put into chains or construct sequences of in order to make proteins. It's proteins that we are interested in. It's proteins which we will be studying. Amino acids just happen to be the letters of those protein words. So how do we get there? How do we get it from a bunch of free-floating letters and bring them together into a single word? How do we bring a bunch of free, independent amino acids together and make a chain of them, which can ultimately fold up into a three-dimensional protein? How do we link amino acids together? And the short answer is we do so with peptide bonds. Peptide bonds are fully covalent bonds. They are shared electrons that occur between the carboxy group of one amino acid and the amino group of another. Amino acids are linked together in this way from amino group to carboxy group end to end to make a chain. When a peptide bond is formed, water is released. Well, that might strike us as a little bit odd, but let's go to the chemistry here. When we make this peptide bond, we're going to be ripping off an oxygen atom from the carboxy group and two protons from the neighboring amino group. And that one oxygen and two hydrogens will come together to make water. Water will leave the reaction as a leaving group. The unsatisfied valence electrons between this oxygen and these two protons will then come together to form a peptide bond. That is the bond that will link those two amino acids together. And again, it's a peptide bond between the carboxy group of one amino acid and the amino group of the other, or the next. Once we have amino acids that are part of chains, we can refer to their side chains in yet a third way, or I'm sorry, we can refer to the amino acids in yet a third way. We will call them residues. So if you hear me use the term residue, I'm simply referring to an amino acid in the context of a larger protein. A single residue is a single amino acid. We reserve the term peptide for short chains of amino acids that vary from two to about two dozen amino acids in length. We use the word proteins for anything larger than that. Proteins are very long chains of amino acids that start off in the hundreds of amino acids long and can go as long as a chain of tens of thousands of amino acids, single continuous chains of amino acids up to the tens of thousands. But no matter how you slice it, whether you're talking about a dipeptide of two amino acids or a mega protein with 60,000 amino acids, nothing changes. All those amino acids are held together in the same way. They're all held together by peptide bonds. We just call peptides and proteins different things so we know whether or not we're talking about a large molecule or a small one. Peptide bond is always written as a single covalent bond, but in fact it exhibits resonance. Resonance is something you should have covered previously in other chemistry courses, but we'll review it here for a minute or two. Resonance occurs whenever you have a double bond neighboring another bond which has the potential to be a double bond as well. And the shared electrons of this covalent bond literally oscillate or fluctuate between being shared here, giving a double bond between this carbon and this oxygen, and shared here, giving a double bond between this carbon and the nitrogen. So this one double bond literally flips and flops back and forth between the two, and that's called resonance. What winds up happening is that you get basically semi-double bond characteristics at each of these two locations. So the bond between this carbon and this oxygen is not quite a double bond, but certainly not a single bond either. It's like a 1.5 bond because that double bond is being shared. 
and the same is true of the peptide bond itself. It's about a 1.5 bond. Stronger than a single bond, not quite as strong as a double bond. What that means for us is because since we have this resonance and we have this partial double bond characteristic at the peptide bond, there's not free rotation around the peptide bond. Normally for single bonds, you can get all the free rotation you want. You can get a 360 degree spin around a single bond. It's like uh, popping a foam ball onto the tip of a pencil. You can spin that foam ball all you want, nothing's going to change. Whenever you have a double bond or even partial double bond characteristics, it's like popping that foam ball onto two parallel pencils. Now it won't spin anymore because those two pencils are holding that ball in place, keeping it from spinning. And the same is true of the peptide bond. This resonance stops free rotation across the peptide bond. We say that the bond is planar, meaning most of the groups are in the same dimension, the same two-dimensional space. There's not much three-dimensional wiggle room across the peptide bond. So this planar bond and its lack of free rotation has some implications for protein structure and shape. One implication is that the side chains flip and flop based on what side of the peptide chain they are on. We'll use this as an example, a generic chain of amino acids. Here we have the first amino acid. We always start an amino acid chain with the amino group. And so we have the amino group, the alpha carbon, the carboxy group, peptide bond. The amino group, the alpha carbon, the carboxy group, peptide bond. Down the line we go, here's our third amino acid, fourth amino acid, fifth amino acid, and sixth amino acid, ending with a free carboxyl group, and that's how all amino acid chains end. We say amino acid groups start with the N group, or they begin with their N terminal residue, and end with their C group, and with their C terminal residue. All proteins go from N to C. Anyway, though, let's go back and look at our first residue. Here, we see that the side chain is going down. It's going down to the bottom of the screen. In the next amino acid, the side chain is facing up. Then it goes down. Then it goes up, down, up. And these side chains are fixed in those orientations because there's no free rotation around the peptide bond. This is called a trans configuration, and side chains are always in trans for large peptide chains. If they didn't do this, and instead those side chains were in a cis configuration, meaning they were on the same side of that peptide bond, we would have the potential for steric interference. Large side chains could conceivably clash with one another and get in each other's way and repel each other. This would distort the backbone of the protein, potentially break the peptide bond, and it would be a giant mess. This way, with a trans configuration, each side chain has plenty of room to kind of spread out and get comfortable and not take up anybody else's space. And again, proteins always go from N to C. The amino N marks the beginning of the protein, and the carboxy N marks the end of the protein. Directionality matters. Remember, dog and God. So the sequence, the direction of the sequence is important. As a side note here, we can talk about things that amino acids do that don't involve making proteins. Amino acids are essential for life well beyond their roles as the building blocks of proteins. Amino acids serve as the precursors for building other molecules that are used in our bodies, such as neurotransmitters and hormones. Tryptophan is converted into serotonin. Some of you may have encountered serotonin in some of our neuroscience classes or elsewhere. This is the feel-good brain chemical. Tyrosine is converted into adrenaline. I'm sure we're all familiar with adrenaline, our fight-or-flight response. L-DOPA, which if you've seen the movie Awakenings with Robert De Niro and Robin Williams, L-DOPA was a wonder drug for catatonic state for a little while. L-DOPA is made directly from tyrosine. And so we can see, for the first time, very superficially, this idea that biochemistry is not binned. Things don't fall neatly into boxes in biochemistry. Certain processes, certain molecules, certain things that have a strong function in one place have an equally strong and important function elsewhere where we would never expect it. So as we go through this course, the threads of material that we cover will intersect and intertwine more and more because all of the biochemistry of life is interconnected and intertwining. So peptides that do phys physiological things. The simplest peptide you can imagine is an amino acid chain of two. If you have an amino acid chain of one, then you just got a single amino acid. So dipeptides are the simplest, shortest peptides imaginable two amino acids linked together by a single peptide bond. 
One dipeptide that we're familiar with is the linkage between aspartate and phenylalanine. When aspartate and phenylalanine come together, they form a dipeptide that tastes sweet, tastes sugary, but it doesn't have a high calorie content because it's just two amino acids. That low calorie, nice tasting, aspartate phenylalanine dipeptide is what we call aspartame or NutraSweet. Not good stuff, shown to have some detrimental effects on overall health and physiology. Glutathione is a tripeptide. It is made up of only three amino acids, and glutathione is critically important for our cells because it gobbles up oxidizing agents, things like free radicals that could break our DNA and induce mutations. Two pentapeptides, that is two separate peptides of five amino acids each, are found in the brain and act as natural pain relievers. It's their structures that are mimicked by opiate drugs, including morphine. Morphine looks like these two pentapeptides, and so fools the brain into thinking that uh, pain is being naturally relieved. Vasopressin and oxytocin are two things that you may have heard about in other classes. They function as hormones and neurotransmitters. Here's oxytocin. We see that it is a simple chain of nine amino acids. And look at that. What's that? That's a disulfide bridge between two cysteines. And we also see that this amino acid chain is going from the N to the C, whoops, from the N to the C direction here. We also see vasopressin is similarly structured. It's also nine amino acids long, and it also has a disulfide bridge. Oxytocin is a hormone which induces labor in pregnant women. In fact, when labor needs to be artificially induced, it's oxytocin that's administered to the mother to induce labor. It's also involved in lactation to get the milk flowing early on after the pregnancy has, um, after the baby's been born. Vasopressin, although it's very similar in shape and structure, has a completely different role. It regulates blood pressure by regulating the contraction of blood vessels. Some blood pressure medications are vasopressin inhibitors, causing blood vessels to dilate and, and have a lower pressure in them. Vasopressin is also an a antidiuretic, makes you pee less and retain more water. So we can see lots of important functions of these different protein types. Um, get some appreciation from this lecture series of amino acids in general, what they're comprised of, how we recognize them. We then dove into amino acids more specifically, different groups of amino acids characterized by their side chain and the different biochemical properties that they have. And then we built chains of amino acids with peptide bonds. Those chains of amino acids uh, have a, a trans configuration with alternating side groups going up and down and then coming together to form functional peptides, at least in small groups. Before we move on and talk about the summary, I do want to make one connection for you. You've probably learned about transcription and translation in other courses. Transcription, of course, is the process of making a messenger RNA copy of a DNA-based gene, and translation is the process of converting that messenger RNA into a chain of amino acids. The peptide bonds that we're talking about here are indeed made in the ribosome as the ribosome is decoding triplets of mRNA into a single amino acids. So everything that you've learned about with messenger RNAs, tRNAs, ribosomes is all happening before the peptide bonds that we have just described here. Those peptide bonds that are formed and water released as a leaving group is catalyzed by the ribosome. That's the very same peptide bond that's made during translation. So to summarize what we talked about here, peptide bonds are covalent bonds between carboxy groups of one amino acid and the amino groups of another cat catalyzed by the ribosome. Water is released, so this is a dehydration reaction, and the bond itself is planar with the groups on both sides being in the same, same dimension. We talked about the trans configuration of side chains to avoid steric interference, and we talked a little bit about small peptides as well and the roles they play in cells. We are now going to leap into lecture three, where we talk about once we make that chain of amino acids, how it folds up into a three-dimensional shape, and how and why the three-dimensional shape that protein folds into is so critically important for the protein and the job that it will be asked to do next. So that's the end of the lecture two material. Thank you so much for watching.